Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon. Let me hear you. Good afternoon. Good. There we go. That's good. I always love it when the weekend uh, rolls around and we can get together as the family of Christ and as Christ Church. Uh, it is the highlight of my weekend, uh, my week, really, and uh, we certainly want that to be the case in your life as well. Even with all the busyness of your days and all the running around and all the enjoying of the weather, it's a beautiful outside today. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, we are glad that you're here, and we hope and pray that when you walk in here, you feel welcomed. We hope and pray that you sense God. I mean, we are just, we've prayed this crazy prayer all weekend long that when you walk in, that you'll just have this God amazing God sense that you'll just feel it the moment that you walk in. Uh, we certainly hope and pray that uh, when, throughout the course of the service you are challenged uh, to walk more closely with Christ. And really, I guess one way to say it is that when you walk in here, you kind of sort of turn your life off and you give God His due. You give God His glory. And for sure, you know, don't get me wrong, we want you to feel encouraged. We want you to feel blessed. We want you to be, uh, you know, we want you to feel good when you walk out of here. But let me just say, Sunday worship is less about us and more about God. Did you get that? Sunday, what we're doing right now is less about us. It's less about us. It's more about God receiving the praise. And every once in a while, you know, you'll hear people say, well, you know, I just don't, I just don't, I'm not being fed at that church anymore. And we're like, well, you know what? Sunday morning is not really just for you to be fed. Sunday morning is for you to walk in here and you to glorify God. And you can feed yourself in a whole lot of other ways and we're going to do our best. But this corporate time is for us to just surrender ourselves and say, God, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. It's like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Worship is our opportunity to put God first in our life. And the corporate expression of that is is for us to say, you know what, God, here I am, here's my life, here's my whole being. I'm just going to worship you for who you are. And our weekend service, again, don't get me wrong, it's designed to, to encourage of all of us, but it's also designed to deepen us. And it's a chance for us to release all of our stuff to Christ. You've heard me say before over the years that God will make a way when there seems to be no way. We believe that. We really, really, really uh, believe that, and we want you to sense that. So, stick around when the service is over, head into the cafe. Um, I just was back there, and they were just unveiling. Somebody brought in these big, huge, huge monster chocolate chip cookies. And I'm just saying, you ought to be the first one back into the cafe and grab some of those. They're like this big around. I'm telling you, whoever did that, that's awesome, all right? Uh, stick around, make some connections, make some new friends, introduce yourself to to people that you may not know, before you leave out of here, get in your car, you drive off our parking lot where then you head into your mission to be Jesus the rest of the week. And that's like, goodness, I hit a bunch of our markers, all of those in one sentence, okay? But we want you to do that. Well, by way of deepening, grab your outlines and grab your Bibles. By way of deepening, we've been in this short little uh, stewardship series for the last couple of weeks, and I certainly pray that you have been encouraged by it. And uh, two weeks ago, if you were with us, we had uh, the Latino uh, Dave Ramsey in the house. Were you here for that service? Okay. And, and uh, his name was Andres Gut Gutierrez, and with a lot of visuals, and uh, including a, a credit card cutting machete. Some of you were here for that. And, and we just walked through here, and we find pieces of credit cards all over the place. I mean, he was just cutting them all the way up. And he inspired us to reduce our debt and to uh, get control of our financial lives. Last weekend, last weekend in this series called Better Way, um, rather than, I, I talked about rather than giving out of obligation or direction or guilt, last weekend I talked about some impacting motivations to give. And if you maybe missed that sermon because you couldn't be here, then, then make sure you go out to our website and, and, and to our, to our uh, podcast or watch it on, our, on the video or whatever. But I really want you to see that message as well. Today, as we wrap up this short little series, I want to talk about another better way to give, and that is to give with joy. All right? Can you say that? Ready on the count of three? One, two, three. Joy. All right? How do you give with joy? Would the word joyful describe how you feel when you give? Anybody? Would the word joyful describe how you feel when you give? A lot of Christ followers would probably say, eh, not really. <laughs> I really don't feel that way, all right? And there may be several reasons for that. Maybe, 
Maybe, uh, you know, uh, you have uh, feelings of obligation when you give, or maybe you feel like your arm has been twisted, or, or maybe you give out of duty, or simply because, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're pretty easy to, to succumb to guilt in your life. And so maybe those are all the motivations that you have to give. It seems far too rare for people to experience any high degree of joy in their giving, and that's primarily because they're still giving the old way. I talked about that last week. I think there is a a better way. On the other hand, there is a better way to give, and it is a kind of giving that produces an overflowing joy, almost this overwhelming flood of joy as we enthusiastically use God's resources to make a meaningful and significant difference in the lives of others. In fact, Let me go so far to say that if you are not experiencing great joy in your giving, it should be a clear indicator as to the fact that something is definitely wrong with how or why or where you give. We should be Christians, followers of Jesus, who experience joy when we give. So I want to talk about this for a couple moments. I think there's a better way to give, and it's with joy. You're going to like this. You're going to like this. Grab your Bibles. Did you know that that, that there are, the the Bible is filled with fantastic illustrations of joy-filled giving? Let me give you a couple of examples. Number one, uh, for example, when the poor and the underprivileged Macedonians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the poor and underprivileged Macedonians, when they got over the top crazy with their giving, Paul, the Apostle Paul says that their giving proceeded out of their overflowing joy. So think about this, read about this. The, the Macedonians, the church in Macedonia, they, these pe- poor people were poor, they were destitute, they were going through a really rough time. They didn't have anything. They basically didn't have two coins to rub together. But in the midst of all that, they gave. And what does it say? It was proceeded out of their overflowing joy. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Paul goes on to tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 that God loves a cheerful giver. Do you see that? Think about that. God loves joy-filled givers. In fact, the Greek word where we get the, the translated cheerful is the Greek word from which we get our word hilarious. So think about this. Put those two things together, all right? What Paul is literally saying here is that God loves a hilarious giver. (laughs) He loves a hilarious giver. How many of you, when you have the opportunities to give, you're like, yay! God loves that. God loves that. You know, Christy and I, we've experienced this kind of hilarious, hilarious giving before. And I, I'm not touting our spirituality at, at all, but, but, and you know, we've shared this uh, testimony before. Christy and I are faithful tithers to God through Westbrook, and we have been for years and years and years. We find joy and we find peace when at the end of the year, when we're putting our taxes together and getting ready to, to, to send them off, let me stop and clarify what I just said. When Christy gets our taxes done and gets ready to send them off, let me just be honest, this is, on, this is on film. I have to make sure that I give her all the credit for that, all right? When Christy gets our taxes prepared and gets them ready to send off, when she comes to me and she tells me that our giving to Westbrook again this year equals 10% of our gross income, when she tells me that, we find joy in that. It's like, yes, that's great. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be faithful to you. It's not a burden for us to give in that way. We've been doing it for so long. It's not a burden for us. We don't miss it. And sure, you know, we could spend that money in a hundred different other ways, couldn't we? But we believe that the tithe, the first 10% is God's. And so there's no question. We give it to God with regularity, with passion, and with faithfulness. And that brings us joy. More so, the first time we set up our giving through e-giving. In front of you, uh, there should be a little card. You see that little card? that has the Westbrook logo. It's probably in the seat pocket in front of you. Go ahead and grab one of those. And uh, that kind of shows you the different ways that you can give here at Westbrook. And the first time we set up our electronic giving through our website a bunch of years ago, and Christy said, Mont, look at this. This, Look how simple it is to give. 
and how fast it is and how regular we can do it. We're like, yes, thank you, that's so awesome. And that has nothing in comparison to when we set up text to give. You can see that on that little card. Text to give. Do you know that you can set this up through your bank and, and you can send a text message to your bank and it automatically just it will, will you know, move that money from your account over to Westbrook's account for your tithe. And, and it's like so fast, and it took a couple minutes, you know, to set it up for the first time. And then now all you do is you type in, you type in Westbrook Tithe into my phone. That's where we save the number, and we put in the number, and then it shoots right back. Are you sure you want to give this? And you just hit a Y, and that's yes. And then it just, you're, it's been processed. And we're like, that's so awesome. That's so great. We were, so, we were like giddy. We were. And I called Yessie, our CFO, and I'm like, Yessie, this is so cool. Everybody needs to learn how to do this. And she'll be back in the lobby today if you want to learn how to do text to give. But it's like so wonderful. We were like, yeah, this is so great. And that's weird, isn't it? I'm just like talking like a madman right now. It just sounds so weird, doesn't it? Being giddy and giving. Yeah. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. He doesn't want our giving to be burdensome and filled with angst and filled with joy or with, with, with fear. He wants our, our, our giving and the experience of our giving to be joyful and, and to be hilarious. That's what God wants. And so I know it sounds weird when you hear the preacher talking about it, but that's what God expects of us. So how is that done? How can we experience <clears throat> this kind of hilarious joy in our giving? Well, I would like to suggest today a couple of steps that are necessary for us to experience maximum joy in our giving. And so grab your outlines because I want, you to, I want you to get all of these down. First of all, we need to get situated to experience joyful giving. I titled it Structured to Give. Structured to Give. Secondly, we need to get proactive to experience joyful giving. So look at those two words. How do we give with joy? Well, there ha has to be structured. It has to be proactive. The first one is kind of like this internal thing that's taking place. You with me? We need to do a little bit of work on the inside to be able to find that joy that God wants us to have. Secondly, it's external. We need, we need to make some decisions to, to give in this way, that way so that we then can find joy. So let's look at these two things. Let me explain both of them to you. First of all, structured. Structured. To be properly positioned and situated and organized to become joyful givers, we must totally surrender three foundational areas of our lives. And the more that we're able to surrender them totally and completely, the more properly positioned we will be to experience the greatest levels of joy in our giving. You work on some of these things, you might find yourself giddy whenever you give in some way. And then you're going to think back at this. When you're like laughing with joy, like, oh, it's so great. You're going to think back to this sermon. Like, we talked about this. All right. So how do we do that? What do we have to surrender? Well, here's the first thing. We must surrender ourselves. If you want to experience joy-filled givers, giving, if you want to experience real joy in your giving, you need to voluntarily relinquish your throne. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay, what I mean by that is, get off the throne of your life. And that's easier said than done. But as long as we insist on remaining the center of our universe, this is me, and the world revolves around me. Are you with me? I'm looking at some of you, seeing if you're going to poke your spouse or your loved one next to you there, all right? You know, relinquish that. It's, the world does not revolve around you. Until you relinquish that position, get off the throne of your life, we will never be able to find and de develop the most profound levels of joy in our giving. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul plainly, and get this, painfully talks about this very thing. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It says this, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another, what? As more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul also questions or, or, or cautions us about an, an unfitting overestimation of ourselves. 
when he says in Romans 12, 3, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Hmm, that's pretty straightforward, don't you think? Listen, here's my point. Unless we are willing to resign the most important person status that we've kind of walked around with, all right, unless we're willing to resign that status and fully surrender our needs and our interests to the needs and the interests of others, we will never be properly positioned to experience the deepest levels of joy in our giving. Jump off the throne of your life. It's kind of like the silly little acronym that we've heard for years and years and years. What is joy? How do we find joy? What's joy all about? Jesus first, others Second, yourself last. We must surrender ourselves to find joy. Here's the second thing, number two. We must not only surrender ourselves, we need to surrender our stuff. Our stuff. Uh, There is something incredibly liberating emotionally and spiritually when we finally come to the realization and embrace the realization that we own nothing. Look up here. Everything. I mean everything that we have. Listen, everything we have does not belong to us. Everything we possess ultimately belongs to God. And He can take it away from us in the blink of an eye. He can take it away from us in a flash. That beautiful home you have, it can be gone in a second in a tornado. That house you have can be gone in a flash, in a fire, whatever it might be. God God owns it all. Think about what he said to Job in Job chapter 41 and verse 11 when he declares this, whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. And he's still declaring the same message to us today. I love how Christian author Jay Link says this. He says this, look at the screen, there it is. It says, for many of us, we have fled with God's stuff and have claimed it to be our own. We need to return this stolen property back to the rightful owner with our humble apologies for having taken it from him in the first place. Everything we have is God. Now, we're going to see that our giving is not about what of my stuff am I going to make available to God, but it's what of God's stuff am I going to make available to him for his purposes. You got that? Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Our giving, look at the screen, our giving is not about what of my stuff am I going to give to the Lord. It is about what of God's stuff am I going to make available for His purposes. Listen, with this realignment of our relationship to our stuff, we are now free to have the attitude that can say quite literally, God, what is mine is yours, and, 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 and I'm just going to be able to give it to you like you want. What is mine is yours, and you can have it. Because we understand that none of the stuff we have is ours in the first place. The bottom line is this. As long as our hands are tightly gripping our possessions, joyful will rarely describe our experience in giving. Corey Tin Boom understood this intense struggle to cling to our stuff. And she advised us with this, these words. She said, hold everything in your hands lightly. (laughs) Otherwise, it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Does that make sense? You and I will never experience joyful giving if God is always having to pry our fingers open around the stuff that we think is ours. For us to deploy his stuff, just say, God, whatever. We need to surrender ourselves. We need to surrender our stuff. Number three, we must surrender our security. Surrender your security. Have you ever thought this before? Have you ever thought, have you ever thought, you know, I need to be careful how much I give away. I need to be careful how much I give away because I don't want to end up not having enough for myself. Have you ever thought that before? Be honest i got to be careful how much I give away because what if, what if, you know, heaven forbid, I run out of stuff to take care of me. If you've thought about that before, then friends, you're in pretty good company (laughs) because most of us have, right? 
most of us have. And when I hear that, often my first response to this fear-based concept is, where's your trust? Where is your trust? Is your trust for your life in your possessions and your provisions, or is your trust for your life in your provider? Where is your trust? But let's just say for the sake of discussion, all right, that you actually became so wildly generous in your giving that you gave away everything that you had. I mean, you just like became crazy, like a crazy man, and you just gave away everything. You gave away your car, you gave away your house, you, get, you handed the title to, to your, your house or whatever to somebody else, and, and you moved out. You were just so crazy generous that you gave everything away. No surplus, no reserves, not even enough to take care of your own personal needs for the future. Let's just say you did that. Here's my question. Would it be wrong, really, would it be wrong with living a hand-to-mouth existence if it was God's hand to your mouth? Are we afraid to live such an open-handed life that we might get ourselves into a position that requires us to depend on God alone? Is that so wrong? Now, it's foreign to us, yes? But is it so wrong? Another Christian pastor and author, Randy Alcorn, nails this very point when he says this. Look at the screen. He says, ironically, giving isn't a cause for insecurity, but a cure for it. A cure for it. But, 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 but we struggle with that. Anne Frank knew this too well. She said this, no one has ever become poor by giving. But that's our perpetual fear, is it not? I, I, don't, want to be so, I don't want to be so generous that I, that I might run out of stuff for me. If I'm so generous that I run out of stuff for me, then what would I do? What would I do? You see, many Christ followers, we want to experience a miracle from God, but no one wants to be in a position to actually need one. Theologian William McDonald takes it one step further when he suggests this. He said, God's will is that we should be in a perpetual crisis of dependence upon Him. We, def we defeat His will when we lay up treasures here on earth. What does the Bible say? Lay up treasures where? Where? Lay up treasures in heaven. You see, we cannot allow trusting in God to be our last resort. It must be our only resort, not first resort. Our only resort. Unless we are willing to surrender what the world tells us is our source of security, then we will be likely more of a fearful giver than a joyful one, more of a miserly giver than an extravagant one. But once we agree to surrender our, ourselves, our stuff, our security, at that point, then we will be positioned and structured to become a joyful giver. Now, uh, are you ready to, to get proactive in your giving? Are you ready? Are you ready to get proactive in your giving? In fact, why don't you say, I'm ready to be proactive in my giving. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I just, I'm so, you guys just like, you just do what I ask. Thank you so much. It makes me feel good. All right. All right. How do you get proactive in your giving? Well, I'm glad you asked that because you're ready to get proactive in your giving. How do you do that? Well, let me give you three practical ways to ju juice up the joy in your giving. Number one, give intentionally. Give intentionally. Far too often, our giving is reactive rather than intentional. We react. We, we, we give when we are asked to give. We give when, when, we, when, we kinda, when that heart hits us, right? Or we get an appeal letter. Or we give when we see a, a sad TV commercial with a little dog scared and cold and shivering or an emaciated horse. We give when we see those kind of things. If we want to experience maximum joy in our giving, friends, listen, we need to intentionally go on the hunt for some place to give. We need to structure ourselves by surrendering ourselves, our stuff and our security, and then intentionally be prepared to give when that time comes, wherever and whenever that time comes. Have you seen this? The thing that's going viral, this picture that's going viral just this week on Facebook. I'll tell the story. Some of you will remember the picture. It's a picture of a woman at an airline counter with her credit card as she's handing it to the clerk. 
The story behind that picture is this. There was a man with a little young little daughter, and they were preparing to fly someplace. When he bought the ticket, his little daughter was two years old, and he understood very clearly that she could sit on his lap and fly for free. So he only bought one plane ticket. When he got to the counter to get his boarding pass, he was told by the clerk that the little girl, according to the, the, the reservation now, was age three, and he would have to buy a full fare ticket. And he was distraught. He didn't have the money for that. And there was a woman standing behind him that stepped up with her credit card and said, I will pay the full fare for this man. $789. And the story behind the woman and her friends was she's a generous person and she's always looking for ways to be able to give that which she has intentionally prepared to give. Can you imagine the joy on that woman? You know? And now the inspiration she has been over the time for that very, very, very thing. You know? Give in that way. Give intentionally. Let me suggest... A better way to give, you know, a better way to give. Here's the deal. Let me say this. If I wait until I'm asked to give, I've waited too long. And so our goal as Christ followers is to become so spiritually in tune to our world and, and the needs around us that we recognize the needs and the opportunities before we're ever approached to help. I can tell you from experience, this is an incredibly enjoyable, exciting way to give. When you're just prepared to pay for somebody's lunch or to buy somebody's Starbucks, it just it makes you feel good when you do that. It makes you feel good. If you want maximum joy in your giving, start intentionally hunting for ways and for where you can give. Here's number two. I've got to hurry. Give passionately. Give intentionally. Give passionately. God gives each of us a unique set of passions, and part of finding maximum joy is giving in places and giving in ways that are aligned with your personal passions. And so we need to have a heart connection to where we invest God's resources in. Giving where there is no passion is dry and lifeless and joyless. But here's the key. For maximum joy, put your money where your heart is. Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Give passionately. Number three, give confidently. Give confidently. Confident giving is critically important for us to experience maximum joy in our giving. Too often people give with little certainty of what they're giving, how it will be used, why it will be used wisely, will it be used effectively. They often have less of an idea of what the gift is actually going to be given to do, right? That's why a lot of times, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, if you're here at Westbrook, you know that all the time we're flipping our services around. We, every time you come in here, it's not the same format. Sometimes we'll sing two songs and then I'll preach and sometimes we'll do two songs in the communion offering. We just flip it around all the time and sometimes people say, would you just do it the same way every time? And we're like, nope, we're not going to because people get bored. We want you to kind of have a little sense of expectation of what's next, Right? But if you've paid attention, a lot of times we will have offering right around the times where we share the announcements. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because we want you to know, you know, we want you to talk, we want you to know about the ministries that your giving goes towards. We want you to see the impact that your giving makes. We highlight that. Even sometimes periodically we even share stories. We want you to engage in these things so that you can have firsthand knowledge of the impact that your giving enables. Bottom line, bottom line, there is nothing that brings greater joy than actually seeing how people's lives have been blessed and changed and the kingdom advanced because of your giving. Just last night on Facebook, I sent a Facebook message to two of our ministry partners and uh, Kendricks and Caroline Pena in the Dominican. And I said, hey, I just want you to know I've been praying for you and we're faithful to give to you as a church and we want you to know we're praying for you. We want a little update. And I sent, shot those off last night. And there's a time difference, especially, you know, in Spain. And would you believe I woke up this morning and both of them has responded. Thank you so much for your prayers. I can't wait to give you an update. And I'll share that with you then, see? so that we all know where our faithful giving is going, and that brings great joy. Look at that screen again. When we proactively start giving intentionally, passionately, 
and confidently, the degree of joy we receive from our giving, I believe, will just explode. So, are you giving or are you ready to get both structured and proactive to experience maximum joy in your giving? If the answer is yes, then friends, strap on and fasten your seatbelt because you are about to begin the joyful giving ride of your life.